Um, thanks for the invitation to speak today. And I, um, my remit was to um, go forward from the talks last week where we um, there were three talks on genome editing and poultry to see what I see the prospects for actually a product going through to market in, in chicken. Um, so I just wanted to point out why poultry is such an important um, animal or food product um, species. This is looking at the number of animals slaughtered, and this is back for 2020. And you'd probably be surprised to realize that um, in that year, 1.3 billion pigs were slaughtered, yet 70 billion chickens were slaughtered. So this is a huge um, number of animals being produced every year on this planet. Um, and to put the, those numbers in other terms, if we look at the total meat, this is 138 million tons of um, poultry meat. Um, in 2020, this was much more than was for pig meat, which was only 120 million. But I think over the last few years, this number might have changed, but still we could say that poultry is close to being the number one um, meat product species on this planet. And also besides the um, meat production, we also have 93 million tons of eggs being produced per year. Um, and as we all know, the demand for animal meat and animal products has uh, really increased over the last few decades and animal um, meat and um, byproducts account for 20% of global protein production this year. We're expecting this to increase by 70, 50% in the next 25 years, owing to population growth. And currently with the production we have, we have significant impacts on the climate, environment, and biodiversity of other animal life. But it has to be stated that um, meat production and meat product production is very important to combat hunger and malnutrition um, in low and middle income countries. We just can't simply switch to plant-based products. Okay. But I should say poultry breeding has been a complete um, achievement for what can be done through selective breeding. So this is showing from 19... The, chick, the typical meat chicken in 1950 to the typical meat chicken seven years ago. And there has been a 79% improvement of meat produced per feed. So in 1950, you would need, you would get um, yield 350 kilograms of meat per ton of feed. And in 2014, this has turned to being 500 um, 90 kilograms of meat for the same amount of feed. So this is an 80%, around an 80% improvement. Also, the time for market has changed from 20 weeks in 1950 to about six or seven weeks, six weeks today for, for the broiler chicken. Um, this means that the demands on the planet are much reduced. Um, in 1950, it would take 80 million hectares of land to produce this amount of meat, and we only need 45 million hectares um, for in for the current production. So how would we expect genome editing tools to help us in any way to in increase, to address the global poultry challenges? So number one, we could ex expect that we can increase sustainability in protein production to maintain this level of, of of meat production each year. We can mitigate some of the negative or the huge negative impacts of greenhouse gassing caused by um, poultry farming. Um, the main um, topic I see that we can address going forward is reducing the burden of poultry diseases. We also, by reducing the number of chickens that die to disease, we also it decrease the negative or increase decrease the negative impacts of poultry farming, and also reducing zoonoses would be um, very important. And this is, of course, with avian influenza, is very important for chicken and waterfowl. And um, as we heard in one of the talks last week, we can also use um, genetic modification or genome editing to increase the welfare of um, poultry chicken. 
And one thing I'm also very interested in is using genome editing to conserve genetic diversity of all bird cyst, um, species. So, um, as I said, my remit is to talk about the issues or the hurdles sp that specifically exist for poultry and poultry genome editing. Um, the first would be the actual edits of editing a poultry species. So many of the methods we use to edit mammalian species and fish species are unfeasible due to the difference in reproduction in bird species. In the top here, you simply see um, that these genome edited tools can be simply directly injected into either a fish oil site or into a mammalian oil site. And these tools will then cut the genome or make the genetic change we're interested in. So this um, little zygote here will be your founder animal, which you can breed from. And unfortunately down here, this is showing the freshly ovulated chicken egg. And you can see by the size of the yolk that um, on top of this yolk, there's a tiny pool of cytoplasm with a single um, nucleus present. So getting our genetic tools into this freshly ovulated chicken egg or bird egg is extremely difficult. Um, but what is amazing about working with poultry and birds in specific in general is that the fertilized egg, the fertilized embryo is in a laid egg. So it's immediately accessible for manipulation. And you can simply um, cut a hole in the shell of the egg and you can use your genome editing tools directly on the embryo. And afterwards, you can seal the egg up and then this will be your genome edited animal that you will, um, this will be your founder animal that can be then bred from in future generations. But what that means is that we're not trying to edit the whole animal. It means that we are we actually intend to ed edit the bird reproductive germ cells. So in bird species, these form very early in the embryo. I'm showing you a picture here of a laid egg and the growing embryo. And these re reproductive cells are present in this early embryo. So what we try to do is introduce our genetic editing tools at these early stages and edit the these germ cells that John talked about, these primordial or early germ cells, um, when they're migrating through the embryo. Um, and this these techniques were first developed by Helen Sang's lab um, 15 or 20 years ago and have been further expanded using CRISPR-Cas9 by the Kichun Lee labs. So one method they have for editing the newly laid egg is just to take adenovirus, which are DNA viruses that can encode CRISPR-Cas9. These can be simply injected into the laid egg, which contains, again, 60,000 somatic cells, but um, 50 reproductive cells. And then some of the edits will be in these um, germ cells. And then if you raise this chicken up, it will be your founder, and then if you breed from it, you can generate your genome-edited animals. Um, another method that can be used is to simply inject DNA transposons or your CRISPR-Cas9 vectors into the blood system of this early chicken embryo. So as the germ cells are migrating through the blood system, the DNA that you inject will actually be taken up by the germ cells and you can hatch your founder embryos in that case. And then when you breed from them, some of them, usually 1%, will contain this either transgene or your genome edit. And what's interesting about this technology is that it works for chicken, but it also seems to work for all bird species. So it is a way to genome edit um, any any potentially any bird species uh, on the planet. Um, a third method that we can use for genome editing of birds is actually to take these primordial germ cells and to 
grow them in vitro. So we, we've actually learned how to culture these from chicken. And there's a few labs that are working on this globally. So you can culture the germ cells. You can introduce your genome editing tools into the germ cells as they're cultured. You can screen them to find the edit that you're interested in. And then you can inject them back into a, a, another embryo, which will serve, as John was saying, as your surrogate host. And these will populate the germ lineage of that animal. And then some of your offspring from that animal will be genome edited. And this is just to show. So I think this first hurdle of generating our edits in at least chicken species um, works really well. So we've learned how to modify the um, these reproductive germ cells at many stages of embryonic development. And this is simply showing what of our off edited offspring on the right um, is a albino chicken. It has a natural mutation in the gene that would make the color a colored feather. And we've simply corrected this mutation and generated genome edited offspring. Okay, so potentially these technologies of genome editing could have major impacts on poultry. And I use the word could here. Um, we could use this technology to transfer adaptive or useful alleles between unproductive um, birds to productive elite birds of that. Um, species. So these could be genes that would make the animal climate adapted to our changing global um, environment. We could also introduce, introduce new genetic changes that potentially could generate a novel beneficial trait that doesn't exist in the, the natural gene pool. This could be a gene that's important for disease resistance. Okay, so I looked at this and I thought, well, I think the important traits going forward for improving chickens for farmers and consumer consumers would obviously be increasing productivity of chicken while lowering greenhouse gases, the environmental impact, in either generating increased or novel disease resistance in poultry, keeping them from dying. And as one of the talks we heard last week was um, also increased in the welfare by eliminating the hatching and the culling of wrong sex chickens. So as this was described, for layer chickens, the males aren't kept, they're culled immediately on hatch. And this leads to the culling of over 3 billion chickens per year. So a genetic editing technology that could eliminate the culling of these man males would be very useful. So a first example I'm showing here is using genome editing um, of CRISPR-Cas9 and adenovirus to increase meat yield in unproductive breeds. So this, as you've heard, um, has been used to knock out myostatin. So myostatin, of course, is one of these genes that inhibits the muscle growth in a livestock animal. And this is work by some of my colleagues. They've actually done this experiment in ducks. Actually, I'm going to turn on my pointer here. They've done this experiment in ducks. They've used a chicken layer, which is used for egg production. And actually, they've used quail. And they've um, mutated the gene or caused a small deletion in the gene that encodes myostatin. In these three bird species, they've increased um, the meat production while um, which would reduce actually the amount of feed needed to produce this amount of meat, which would lead to an environmental benefit. So the potentially this is one product that could go forward to market. Um, what I'm more excited about is my work by my colleague um, in the um, Dr. Henger um, which he published in 2022. So this was the first genome edited chicken that was resistant to an avian um, um, viral disease. And the disease is avian leukosis virus. So this is a um, chicken disease that infects um, the B cells of the chicken and it leads to formation of a tumor. It's a global problem. Um, 
we've um, actually the industry has taken care of it just by segregation and elimination of the transmission of this virus. But it's still a ongoing problem with the poultry industry. And what Dr. Henger's lab found is that if they changed a single amino acid in a re the, rece the receptor that the virus used to enter the cells, the chicken were completely resistant to the avian leukosis virus. So this was what I saw as one of the first products that could be going to market um, for the poultry industry. Um, unfortunately, I'll say, and this leads to the second problem, editing for disease resistant is very difficult, especially for viral resistance because the virus can rapidly mutate um, to get around this genetic change. And this is exactly what the Henger lab found. Um, this was only published um, a few days ago. So what they found is that avian leukosis virus could get around this single amino acid change that if what they've grown is fiber cells from edited and from these edited chickens or unedited chickens, and they found that the virus could rapidly escape and infect these edited chickens. Um, what they've, and this shows actually when they infected, I'm sorry, it's a little complicated figure here. What they showed is that when they, this mutated virus, um, or in vitro selected virus was able to infect wild cell, wild chickens, but actually it also was able to infect these genome edited chickens. So it got around this genome edited, which leads to the suggestion that anytime we're going to want to genome edit poultry for disease resistance, we're going to actually have to make multiple edits. And what the Henger lab showed is that actually additional edits within the same receptor actually led to disease resistance. So more edits in this single target could actually stop the spread of the viral disease. Um, a more interesting target would be even influenza resistance. And we heard a talk by Darrow um, Kabzinski last week week where he talked about avian influenza and the problems it caused for um, the poultry industry and also for birds um, globally. Um, so genome editing for flu resistance would be just an amazing feat. Um, my lab has been working on this and we published a paper where we showed that if we change two amino acids in a single gene, we could actually make generate chicken that were resistant to avian influenza. So the, the, the virus could no longer grow in these chickens, showing them here, the chickens were healthy. They laid the normal amount of eggs. They had the normal amount of response to, to vaccination. Um, and this was well received. So as I said, genome edits um, to create disease resistance for something that actually could infect humans, I think would be very well received by consumers and the general public. Unfortunately for us, the virus, the flu virus, rapidly mutated and was able to get around the single genome edit and infect and then infect our edited birds. But what we did discover, and I show here, is that if we genome edit two other similar genes to this one gene, which is called ANP32A, the cells in this case, I'm showing you here, were resistant. So we actually, we think, just as like Henger found, that we would have to create multiple genome edits to make poultry um, resistant to avian influenza. And this leads to my second hurdle that we're going to need to, to um, get over to be able to bring a product to the market for poultry, and that's to be able to generate multiple genome edits for disease, disease resistance. So the main problem in poultry for doing this compared to other species is this, and I'm sorry, um, I stole this slide from Allison Van Eendemann this morning, and this is showing a um, 
the breeding structure for poultry. So poultry, as I, I said, we produce 70 billion chickens per year. Um, this is done through this pyramid breeding structure where at the top we have selected pedigree chickens, um, which exist in usually in four separate flocks that are bred together. In each of these flocks, we have over a thousand genetically distinct individuals, and these are bred together to create this huge pyramid. So if we wanted to genome edit for a poultry flock, we would want to edit every single one of these um, individuals. So the idea of generating an output pedigree flock containing multiple genome edits to, see, to me seems like a, a tall task to bring forward. And that this also leads to my third hurdle. Hurdle is if you're going to carry out multiple genome edits in a large, of a, large number of animals, you're gonna to have to be able to verify if we required all the off targets that are created during this process in multiple individuals. Um, it's very nice when we show this slide of our tools saying we can go into the genome of an animal and change a single base pair, but that's actually what it doesn't look like. When we're looking at the genome, and this is simply, this is over 50,000 base pairs, what we can do is we can sequence the immediate region around that and show that we actually have changed a single amino acid. And then if we're required, we can actually go through the genome and try to find other areas that quite could have been edited by our genome edited tools. The problem is with the size of the genome is that we have to scan through, um, let's say, millions and millions of base pairs till we would find what could potentially be a edit, a nonspecific edit that was caused by our genome edit. In this case, we might be, expect to see one every 15 million base pairs. So that means going through 50 million base pairs, finding a genetic change that could have been caused by our tools. So this is all very interested, and this, this works very well with species that we have a nice reference genome. The problem with poultry is that the, these pedigree flocks are completely outbred, and we're not looking at a genome like that. What we're looking at is a genome, we're looking at a single base pair change, and also what we expect in each of these birds is a, is a novel SNP or base pair difference that appears once every 150 base pairs. So the idea of to be able to look at through these populations, multiple populations, and find these genetic changes is going to be really a difficult, very difficult task. And then the final hurdle that I wanted to talk about, besides saying we're going to have to multiple, we're going to have to edit multiple genes in multiple individuals correctly, is that there are many different um let's say chicken species on the planet, all with their um, unique characteristics and all with their unique value. So for chickens, we have probably around a hundred commercial breeds that have been um, selected and are very productive, but also we have 1400 local or breeds that exist in every country on this planet. All of these are interesting for production all of these are very useful and, the, and these are all unique. So the idea is how actually we could imagine editing one flock of chicken for one breed, but how are we actually going to introduce these breeds into these 1400 local breeds of chicken? And also for farmers, there's many commercial breeders of farmers, but also there's many farmers who, with small flocks that exist planet wide that keep these local breeds of chicken and the idea of actually having impact for introducing disease resistance to these farmers is going to be very difficult and again our output should be consumers in lower low middle income countries and high income countries so we need to know that genetic edited poultry gets to all these markets um this is a final slide, so it's just looking, again, I think I do have a few more minutes, so it's just to look globally what I think would be needed for edited poultry products to reach the marketplace. Um, 
I think we are going to need comparable poultry is a global product. So we're going to need comparable regulations between countries that are enforced ethically. I mean, what I mean by this is they're enforced equally between countries and in the same manner. Um, off targets will be a big problem to be able to identify in these outbred populations. So perhaps if we could just have a simple validation looking for the presence or absence of an exogenous DNA in these genome edited animals, that would be a better solution for us for editing poultry. Um, it's important for poultry species that we focus on preserving the genetic diversity during the editing process. We don't want to inbreed these chickens. We want to preserve multiple genotypes and we don't, we need to not to bottleneck these populations. And also somehow we have to incentivize industry to try to use and edit these local breeds. So they're not as productive as commercial breeds, but somehow, um, we need to monetize or somehow incentivize that um, companies would be interested in changing the, um, the outputs or the productivity of some of these local breeds. And at that point, I just want to mention my funders just to show where my funding comes from. Um, these are the global, um, sorry, these are the commercial governmental um, agencies, commercial agencies that I'm working. And I'm going to stop sharing there and I'm willing to take your questions later on.